ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Science Riot! Put your hands together and welcome your host tonight, my hero, Ms. Fanny Spanking! Hello, hello! Hello, everybody! Hello, Denver Museum of Nature and Science! How is everyone tonight? Hey! Well, hello and welcome. I am your hostess this evening. I am uh, Fanny Spankings. Yes, that's right. It's my name. It's also a lifestyle. It's nice to see you all here at the museum. Thank you all for coming out for Science Riot. What? Do you like comedy? Yeah. Do you like science? Yeah. Hey, well, you're in the right place. You like having a little cocktail, too, after a long day, huh? That's good. That's good. Please bring a drink in. You can. And then just take the cup out with you, right? It's, it's, it's all we ask of you. It's a little pack it in, pack it out. Mm, okay. So how, how about this? This is going to be a lot of fun tonight. This is my second time here at Science Riot, and I am so lucky to be around all you mm, glorious brainiacs, huh? Now, I have to know, do you have family or friends? friends in the show tonight. Here, right, a round of applause. Yeah! Now this is a this is a hard gig because these comedians are making their stage debut tonight. Yes, that's right. Yes. These are all intelligent, amazing, mm, very, very knowledgeable people. But perhaps they haven't had the opportunity to get their chops out there to really entertain. And so tonight, graduating from their Science Riot summer course, they are here to present their stand-up gig for you guys. Yes. <laughs> Now, I know you'll give them a lot of love. I know you're going to let them know that, uh, that you support their arts. But before we get going, I just I want to give you a little information about myself. I, I am Fanny Spankings because I am a, uh, I'm a burlesque performer, uh, an MC here in town, here in Denver. Hi, yeah. Now, I also took a, a, a foray into the pharmaceuticals. I mean, I know we all have, but come on. I, I got so recently certified as a pharmacy technician with uh, aspirations of heading on down into Pharmacist, what? Yes, yes. Nightlife, drugs, it just seemed to go hand in hand. I, I really felt like it was a good fit for me. So uh, I, I do, I appreciate that you guys invited me here. I, I, I am not as smart as some of these. I was talking back there backstage. You wouldn't believe the conversations that are. They, they've, solved, they've solved all of our problems back there. I can't wait for you guys to hear them. But I have to say that uh, I, I uh, I'm very excited because I am a Denver native and there isn't a lot of like, yeah, yeah, who else is a Denver? There's like four of us on the highway at any given time. <laughs> Just four. So I, I did, I grew up out here and uh, I, I grew up actually in Boulder with uh, my hippie mom. Yep, got all the patchouli and LSD that one could possibly need to form a growing mind. And uh, so I, I am excited when I get to meet other, other people from, uh, from our parts here. Mm, our parts. So now before we get started, I, I, do, I do have to tell you that we, um, well, we wouldn't be here tonight without the first pre presenter. She is hilarious. She is the instructor. This is something that you, you too, can achieve your dreams of being on the stage and being a comedian, huh? Now, Science Riot has it's it's all over the it's all over the country, but the Denver chapter right here is with you tonight. And so, if you're interested, please come and talk to us after the show. This woman would love to have you. She wants to give you just a little taste of uh, her experience and who she is. But she is your instructor. She is your guider. She's fantastic. Good friend of mine. She actually did a little bumping and grinding back in the day too. You guys, what? Yes. So I'm gonna bring her out here right now. My good friend and yours. Welcome to the stage, Miss Jesse Hansen. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm a little out of breath. I introduced Fanny from backstage. I never thought when I signed up for graduate school I was going to spend my career sprinting through the paleontology department in four inch heels of leather pants. <laughs> but science takes you weird places, right, folks? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this past Halloween, I dressed up as the sexiest celebrity I could think of, Jane Goodall. Because <laughs> she was my hero when I was a kid, and I was going to grow up to be a scientist like her. I was going to sit in the jungle and have 
beautiful silver hair and look at monkeys and be sexy. And then I found out that being a scientist actually means sitting in a windowless room with a strange guy. <laughs> whose name is Jared. Um, so how did I get into science? Well, first of all, I got a master's degree in biology, or as I call it, a certificate of disappointment. <laughs> Glad I took out those student loans, everyone. And then I realized with a degree in biology, you can... <laughs> or you can. <laughs> and so I went back to school again. Uh, and I became a medical laboratory scientist and got a second degree in that. And I sat for my board exams. And I became certified to work in a job so lucrative that I pay the bills moonlighting as a stripper. <laughs> Which, as Fanny told you, is absolutely true. <laughs> But it turns out being able to identify body fluids works really well for both laboratory scientists <laughs> and strippers. Uh, which two body fluids fluoresce under blacklight? See, see, if you're a laboratory scientist, you know these things. Um, so I had to give you one bit of information or advice to be like, don't go into science. <laughs> science as a thing is amazing, but science as a job kind of sucks. Um, science is repetitive. Let me repeat, <laughs> science is repetitive. So what I do as a medical laboratory scientist, who here knows what an MLS is? Thanks for coming, Jared. Um, <laughs> so there's 200 people in this room and two of you know what a laboratory scientist is. So I work in a hospital and I do laboratory diagnostics. So if you go to the doctor, they draw your blood, you pee in a cup, That's what a master's degree will get you, people. Um, so I do that, and people ask me, like, what do you analyze? And I'm like, I'm an expert. Anything you can secrete, I can analyze. <laughs> Which is why I don't talk about either one of my jobs on dates. <laughs> uh, so part of what I do is, you know, I, I look at your blood, I look at your pee, and I tell the doctor what's wrong with you, and then I run additional tests depending on what diagnostics he or she thinks that you might be having a disease or pathology from. Um, a big part of my job is dealing with doctors, or as they think of themselves, God. <laughs> and they are always super, super concerned if I didn't run a test on something. I'm like, did you order the test? And they're like, no. And then I'm like, then it's not my problem. <laughs> So doctors have to learn the same thing that women have to learn. If you want something, you have to ask for it. <laughs> Specifically, and probably more than once. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna leave the stage tonight and give it over to the next one. Thank you very much for coming out there. Jesse Hansen, everybody. Give her some love, yes. Jesse, tell ya. She did, she did do a little strip teasing. It's vintage strip teasing, you know, burlesque is, you know? It's, it's basically, it means that uh, you're more artistic, you're more empowered, and you make a lot less money, so. Well, but I'm a big fan. I do believe that we all were born naked. We all should just get a little naked every once in a while, you know? Come on, ow! Ah, uh, that's what I'm saying. But uh, these guys here tonight, they are cruel. Hi, darling. It's good to see you out there. Look at my friends. Now, I have to know, I have to know, uh, um, I heard some, some Colorado natives, natives? Let me hear them again. Yes, yes, okay. Now, I did leave, I did leave briefly. I did, I know. You'll, uh, I, went, I moved to Pennsylvania, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not proud of it. But, uh, but when we, we, we legalized the pot, and we built an Ikea, and so we came rolling on back, you guys. <laughs> rolling on back, yes. And I know people will ask, does marijuana affect the pharmaceutical industry? And I said, no, I, I mean, I'm from Boulder. You know I was self-medicating long before they legal. What? Outrageous. Now, <laughs> so this performer that we're going to have out, our first, our first debut here tonight. Are you ready to see some freshmen? Ah, oh, they're so charming. They're so good. And they're so smart. They're so smart. Now, this girl, she has a master's degree in environmental management and marketing, okay? Which is how she ends up with uh, some pretty fantastic, weird environmental education jobs. You guys, she happens to be the sustainability coordinator at the University of Denver. Yeah. 
hell yes. Helping those budding minds. Hmm, put your trash in the trash can, jerks. <laughs> Just, yeah. they're, t- they're college kids. It's okay. It's okay. Now, you guys, tonight she's giving us the scoop on mm-hmm, mm-hmm, why we only think we care about, well, really anything, huh? Yeah! Tonight, let's bring her out here. This is Emily Scosid. Hi! Emily! Hi! Wow, okay. Thanks, hi. Um, Okay, so how many of you think it's a good thing to pick up litter when you see it on the ground? Okay, so like 91% of you? Um, Great, but... um, Statistically speaking, those of you who would actually pick up litter is closer to about 10%. And that's because, well, litter's disgusting, Um, but mostly it's because of something known as the knowledge behavior gap, which basically means that knowing something is a really bad predictor of whether or not you'll do something. You know litter's bad, but you don't pick it up. You know you need eight hours of sleep to not feel like shit, but you stay up all night binging the office anyway. (laughs) You know that guy you met on Tinder is trash, but you're not gonna throw him away either. (laughs) It's also why um, you've probably been seeing pictures of polar bears sadly floating along on the icebergs for 20 years, but you still probably contributed to climate change by driving here tonight. (laughs) Also, Polar bears are useless. (laughs) So, as Fanny said, my background is in environmental studies and marketing, two of the most depressing sciences. (laughs) My work revolves around trying to find ways to bridge that knowledge behavior gap, um, mostly around teaching people how to reduce their environmental impact and create a more just and sustainable future, basically making AOC queen of the universe. Um, I work at DU, and every day my students come to me and say, we just have to educate people more, and then they'll care about the environment and change their behaviors. So they want to bridge the knowledge behavior gap with more knowledge. And that's really like trying to um, cure your Sunday morning hangover by chugging bottomless mimosas at brunch. But it's not just my students who want to do this. Most scientists think that we can just shove data and information at people and they'll suddenly start believing in climate change and vaccinating their children and thinking the world is round again. (laughs) Um, But like polar bears, data is useless. And there's a lot of reasons why, but I'm just gonna touch on two of them very briefly. So first of all, Um, Science has become something that's really inaccessible to non-scientists. There's this idea that scientific literacy is reserved for the nerdy, overeducated elite, like us, uh, (laughs) rather than something that politicians should have a basic understanding of before assuming office. (laughs) Most of the time, if a scientist tries to talk to the general public about science, people will just nod and smile until you shut up and go away, having learned nothing Kind of like my college students do. Uh, Every time I try to say things are fire or lit AF. (laughs) It doesn't help that we scientists have made basically no effort to try and communicate science in a digestible way, opting instead to publish things in peer-reviewed journals that nobody reads because they are not lit AF. But even if people did understand science, you still need something other than more knowledge to get across the knowledge behavior gap. So what is that? Well, a lot of research suggests that you need an emotional reaction to the topic. Uh, um, Environmentalists realized this about 20 years ago when they decided that the perfect poster child for climate change would be Arctic murder bears. because they are what's known as charismatic megafauna. (laughs) Yeah, only polar bears are charismatic the way that Joe Biden is charismatic. (laughs) All right, a lot of Joe Biden fans out there. Um, (laughs) They're really endearing when they're far away and (laughs) eating ice cream or baby seals. 
they come up close to you, they start smelling you. And then they get up into your business in a way that is very unpleasant. <laughs> The theory was that people would feel bad about the sad murder bears, and that would make people try to do something to stop climate change. Only nobody cares about polar bears. And you have to care about something a lot if it's going to make you stop driving cars, stop eating meat, and stop ordering pointless shit on Amazon Prime. So... <laughs> Um, I mean, polar bears, they're thousands of miles away. Nobody has a really personal connection to a polar bear. And like, Klondike and Snow were super cute, but if a cute baby animal existed before the internet, did it ever really exist at all? <laughs> it's just really hard to draw the line between whether or not that polar bear survives and whether or not I turn my lights off when I leave the house. Partially because that line between that polar bear and my actions is about as straight as the pride parade was. <laughs> and mostly because if that polar bear dies, spoiler, he did. Um, but if he does, what meaningful change does that really have on my life? Now, it's not that I don't think polar bears have an intrinsic value as a fellow species on planet Earth. I totally do. It's just that I think polar bears are about as good at motivating people to change their behaviors as bottomless mimosas are at motivating you to take it easy on the day drinking. <laughs> so what does work? Well, it's actually stuff like Science Riot. Um, yeah, I've always had a really hard time with how inaccessible science is for non-scientists. And so I've done a lot of work trying to take science out of those journals that nobody reads and put them into other forms that nobody reads. <laughs> uh, things like theater, um, movies, uh, and poetry. I shit you not, my master's thesis was a scientific poetry reading. It was weird as fuck. And if Fred Armisen had been there, he would have definitely turned it into an episode of Portlandia. <laughs> But I was explaining really complex science to English majors, and they were having no problem understanding it. Because when science is in a poem, or a theater, or a play, it stops being something that non-scientists can't do, and starts being the thing that Denver hipsters live for. <laughs> Not only that, but, these art forms exist specifically to give people deeply personal emotional reactions to the topic and deeply pretentious Instagram posts. <laughs> but it makes people care in a real way about the thing that they're talking about. And that's really all we need to create behavior change. You could say it kills both polar bears with one stone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, we're so filled. <laughs> Damn. I don't know about you, but I was feeling personally attacked about them bottomless mimosas. Yeah, I mean, I just, those are delicious AF, ladies and gentlemen. They really are. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got our first, uh, first debut. Who's ready for a gentleman? Hmm? Yes. So the doll back there, I was chatting with him a little bit. Now, he happens to be British, which already makes him sound brilliant and amazing. Love it. Now, he's a postdoctoral fellow, you guys, studying RNA's contribution to placental development. Yes, that sounds no small, no small task. Now, he needs a lot of placentas for this, okay? <laughs> I, he'll be telling us how the, this process transpires. And, uh, well, it sounds like we're going to need a mop and bucket out here. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's bring out Owen Vaughn. <laughs> Thanks, Fanny. Incidentally, I think Fanny means something else in the UK. But... <laughs> so, evening all. Thanks for coming. My name is Owen. I'm a postdoc. I do research in pregnancy. So, anybody like babies? We all like babies, right? I don't. I don't. Babies are fucking disgusting. I mean, don't tell my wife, right? But, you know, 
vomiting all the time, shitting themselves. I mean, that's the baby, it's not my wife. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, everybody was a baby at one time or another. So I guess it's kind of important to know where they come from. So, so where do babies come from? I mean, it's not, quite, it's not quite what you're thinking, right? I mean, it's not all fun. <laughs> you know, uh, to be honest, your dad's part is pretty small. I mean, I don't mean your dad's got a small dick. <laughs> what, I, what I mean, what I mean is that the paternal energetic contribution to mammalian reproduction is small. So, I mean, think about it, right? You know, after your mother and your father are done making the old four-legged monster, and you've got, you've got a fertilized human egg, a zygote. And a zygote, a human zygote, is about, you know, a millionth of a gram in weight. It's pretty small. So to get from that fertilized zygote to a full-term newborn baby that weighs about three kilograms, that zygote's got to increase in size about a billion times, about a billion fold. You know, a billion fold is a lot. That's about how many folds my local laundry gets to in a year. <laughs> you know, and if you compare that to the increase in size from a baby to an uh, adult, that's only about 20 fold, which is not so much. So you can see you do a lot of growing before you're born. And all of the nutrients, all of the energy, the protein, the fats, the amino acids, the carbohydrates to make that three kilogram baby don't come from the father. They come from the mother, but they come from the mother via the placenta. So it's the placenta that makes a baby, right? So, uh, you know, I do research on the placenta, and on a day-to-day -day basis, I go to the hospital with my bucket to pick up the placenta <laughs> from the maternity ward. <laughs> and you know, you know what they call it? You know what they call it? The chicken bucket. I mean, who the hell am I, Colonel Sanders? Uh, guys, I'm looking for a placenta today. Or do you want uh, fries or mash with that? <laughs> so, I mean, the placenta is pretty special, as I say. Uh, you know, we've probably all got a vague idea what the placenta does. It sort of anchors the umbilical cord that holds the baby in place to the side of the mother's uterus, the womb to stop the baby sort of floating off like a, like a stone butterfly or something. <laughs> but it's so much more than that. You know, it provides all of the nutrients that the baby needs to grow. It takes away the waste. So it's like uh, a food purveyor and a, a waste disposal facility combined. I mean, it's a bit like a McDonald's. <laughs> so, when I'm there, with my chicken bucket, and you know, I go off to the hospital, and sometimes we get a false alarm. You know, you get a call at four o'clock in the morning, somebody's about to deliver their full two newborn baby, do you wanna come and pick up the placenta? Okay, I'm on my way. And you know, you end up there, sometimes there's a false alarm, you're in the waiting room, there with the other dads. <laughs> so, uh, what are you expecting, a boy or a girl? Well, not quite. <laughs> but, pl but placentas do have sex. They are male or female, so it does make a difference. So the special cells in the placenta uh, are called trophoblasts. Uh, trophoblasts, that comes from the Greek, uh, which means to nourish or to feed. Makes sense, right? And blast, because, well, we're all having a fucking great time. <laughs> So, you know, and they're, they're really magical cells. They start off there, early on in pregnancy, they come from the embryo, so they're part of the embryo, and they invade out into the walls of the mother's uterus, and they go into a blood vessels to change the shape of the blood vessels so that the, the fetus gets enough uh, blood supply, enough oxygen and nutrients from the mother. But then the important thing is that the mother's blood and the fetus's blood don't mix in pregnancy. They stay totally separate. So later on in pregnancy, those trophoblasts, those special cells, do another trick where they fuse together to form one huge cell. 
that's about the size of a, a tennis court. Oh, that's half a football pitch for the locals. Uh, <laughs> and it's very large in surface area, but it's really thin. It's about six microns thin. That's about as thin as the evidence in the Mueller report. <laughs> and all of the, all of the evidence, all of the, sorry, evidence, all of the nutrients, <laughs> all of the nutrients have to get from the maternal circulation to the fetal circulation by crossing over that really thin barrier. And there are special transporters in that barrier that move the nutrients from mother to fetus. So that syncytium, that syncytial trophoblast, is a bit like the counter in McDonald's. <laughs> and the transporters are a little bit like the greasy, spotty kid who serves you the Ma Big Mac in McDonald's. Uh, so anyway, you know, I go to the hospital with my chicken bucket and eventually uh, the lucky lady is done pushing, the, a, new life enters, a new life enters the world and I'm there ready to get my placenta. <laughs> but you know, the job's not done yet, there's always some other tribulation because people always find some interest in use for placentas. Uh, you know, the ancient Egyptians really sort of worshipped placentas actually, they thought they were really special, sacred organ because they thought they were the placenta and the baby were twins. Kind of like the original Mary Kate Nashley. <laughs> and you know, even today, in the 21st century as we are, uh, you get some interest in uh, society, societal sort of sects wanting to eat the placenta. Uh, we call them hippies. <laughs> I mean, come on, to be honest, it's pointless, right? There's no evidence for it being of any use whatsoever. It's supposed to be full of hormones, but they're all digested in, the, in your digestive tract, if you eat the placenta. And, you know, what's more, like I just told you, the cells that make up the placenta come from the baby. So if you eat your placenta, that's kind of cannibalism. <laughs> And to, to be honest, it's just plain gross. <laughs> anyway, so if, if, once the baby's delivered, and if it's not an ancient Egyptian or a hippie, then luckily then I get the placenta and I take it off back to the lab. And that, that's where the fun really starts. That's where we can do some science. Uh, you know, so normally I either homogenize up my placenta to make a nice sort of placenta smoothie. <laughs> it's a bit, like, a bit like strawberry milkshake. Well, it doesn't taste like strawberry milk. <laughs> or at least, at least not, I mean, so I'm told. <laughs> or what we can do is isolate out the special cells, the trophoblast cells from the placenta, and grow them in a dish and look at how they work. So we're really starting to generate some, some good evidence for uh, how those cells work and how the way they work is related to how the baby grows. And we think quite often when uh, pregnancy doesn't turn out as well as it could and you get maybe a baby that's a little bit sick it's because the placenta hasn't done its job properly. A bit like if you get sick eating that Big Mac it's because that greasy little bastard in McDonald's didn't do their job properly. <laughs> but, but I mean seriously you know if you get those kids who are growth restricted who didn't grow so well when they were a, a fetus we know that the cells from their placenta don't work as well. They don't transport the nutrients as well, they don't tra transport amino acids and glucose so well, and they don't do such a good job of invading into the mother's uterus. What we also know even more is that those kids, unfortunately, are at increased risk as newborns, but also they are at increased risk of having diseases like diabetes and heart disease when they get older. So what by trying to understand how the placenta works and helps them to grow, we think that the way the placenta works programs these kids' physiology before they're born. Uh, and that's why we think in understanding it, maybe one day we can develop treatments for babies who don't grow so well. So maybe next time you're pregnant, uh, think about uh, donating us your placenta for some research. Don't, don't eat it. <laughs> Give it to me so I can make the placenta smoothie. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Owen Bond, ladies and gentlemen. Ah!
Amazing. Now, I, I, I happen to have a daughter. She is seven, and uh, my husband did sign on to be my, my life partner as a burlesque husband Sherpa. He has to take my suitcase and my props and is constantly afflicted with the glitter lung at the house there. But when we had the baby, I, I was insistent that we bake the placenta. And I know this sounds, but I mm, got my little bucket. Well, actually... It was an Igloo brand cooler. Those things are fantastic. And we took it home and uh, he did, he put it in the oven for me, you guys, for 10 hours on 175 degree Fahrenheit. And it was, uh, well, <laughs> the neighbors stopped by. They thought it was Thanksgiving. <gasps> what? Ah, oh, come on, you guys. Science! Science! <laughs> No, I was worried about postpartum depression. I have to admit that I, I had a lot of success with avoiding it. So, yay, the research is out there. Or donate it to my friend back there. He's got a bucket waiting, you know? <laughs> now, you guys, this next performer coming out, this, uh, this next presenter, comedian, this lovely lady. Now, she is, uh, well, she, she's earned her PhD by studying the intestinal microbiome of mice. Yes, that is exciting, isn't it? I mean, I can't even, she, she wasn't, I mean, that really, she did that for a long time, but even still, she wanted to prove she was the eternal student, ladies and gentlemen. So she is currently an MD candidate at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. What? Yes, she's gonna be saving all of our lives one day after the uh, bottomless mimosas at brunch, so. <laughs> Thank you to this lady. Now, she's uh, she's done a lot of research, and uh, well, some of it, you know, it's it's kind of confirmed that you know, maybe you can blame your mother. So at the end of the day, I don't, let's bring her out here. Let's bring her out here. Let's get ready to meet you guys, Taylor Soderborg. Hey, girl. Dropping a deuce, pinching off a loaf, code brown, igniting the rectal rocket, taking a number two. We've invented a lot of phrases to avoid directly talking about defecation. I, on the other hand, I love talking dirty. <laughs> Now, you might be wondering why, and it's because I just spent five years completing a PhD studying these adorable little toilet snakes. <laughs> At the highest level of education, I studied absolute crap. <laughs> which, which some people think all PhDs are, but in my case, it was actually true. <laughs> so I studied the gut microbiome and how it contributes to our health. I got a poop HD. <laughs> All right, um, so we like to think that we are in control of our destinies. So if you ask any CrossFitter, yeah, yeah, I'm the master of my fate. Uh, okay, Jeff, put down the protein powder because I have some bad news for you. We are actually fantastically outnumbered by the bacteria in our gut. Like, I'm talking like trillions to one. So you can think of your gut microbiome basically as Netflix autoplay. <laughs> your gut microbes are the 201 episodes of The Office, and you're just 3 a.m., one more episode. <laughs> so yeah, you have some control, but clearly not much. So it wasn't until recently, though, that scientists realized, hey, perhaps all this bacteria in our gut actually plays a role in our metabolic, immunological, and even our psychiatric health. So how do we prove that the microbiome has a role in disease? Well, we use germ-free mice. So you can think of these, they're like basically the bubble boys of the animal kingdom. They've never seen any bacteria and they like literally live in plastic bubbles. So someone realized, hey, you can feed these mice poop slurpees of whatever population you want to study the microbiome from. And you can see what happens to the critter's health. Obesity poop slurpee, the mice get fat. Depression poop slurpee, the mice get sad. Pregnancy poop slurpee, no, the mice did not get pregnant. Uh, 
what they did, they got the same insulin resistance that you see in normal pregnancy. But if you thought that they got pregnant, I'm gonna need you to go home and look that up on your own because we're not, I'm not teaching you about that tonight. <laughs> um, all right, so ba basically what scientists have realized is that the gut microbiome actually plays a role in causing some of these diseases. All right, so most of this research has been done in adults, which is an absolute waste of time. You all are just lost causes. But babies, on the other hand, they can be helped. So we do know that when babies are born to moms with obesity, they are at risk of becoming more obese themselves later in life. So maybe we can intervene it through the gut microbiome. So I, I know Owen just told you all about the placenta and like how we should like eat it or like eat our babies or something. Is that what, is that what he said? Did I get that right? Uh, so I'm don't, don't do that. Really what matters is the early life gut microbiome. And to prove it, we will actually be dueling in the parking lot afterwards. It's gonna be placentas versus baby poop. And uh, Owen, you get one placenta per a kid, but baby poop, yeah, it's endless. <laughs> Yeah, babies love pooping. They are the perfect population, guys. <laughs> All right, so what actual evidence do I have for this? So um, cue up those germ-free mice. I colonized those germ-free mice with either poop from babies who had been born to normal weight moms or poop from babies who had been born to moms with obesity. All right, so before I go any further, I know you guys are all wondering, what is my poop slurpee recipe? So I will tell you, so take out your pens or whatever, your smartphones. Okay, so step one is you have to smash up the baby poop, and then you have to weigh it to exactly one-tenth of a gram, like you're some little weird fecal drug dealer. <laughs> and then you put it into a solution, and then you walk across campus all casual-like, you don't have a vial of poop in your pants. <laughs> And so then you get to you get to enter a high security area. And so like we're not talking like White House level of security, we're talking like you actually have to have proven a reason that you need to be there. <laughs> so once you get into the facility, you gently but firmly, you have to grab the mouse and then you have to convince it to swallow the gavage needle, which is basically like the poop slurpy straw. And then you gently depress the contents into the stomach. And then the last step is you give the microbes three weeks to move into their new home and three weeks for the mouse to recover physically because emotionally, I don't think they do. Um, so if you're still having trouble visualizing what we do, let me recommend the timeless classic film, Human Centipede. Yeah. I, I, I have not seen that movie twice. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I did not invent this method, but I did use it a lot in my research. So if there is a mouse hell down there somewhere, uh, I don't think I'm going to the ninth circle, but I do think that Pinky and the Brain have saved me a special spot somewhere around like layer seven. <laughs> so you can probably see it now. Pinky's like, Brain, what do you want to do tonight? And Brain's like, same thing we do every night, Pinky. Feed this human poop slurpees. <laughs> so I'm gonna enjoy my time while I'm here, just in case. <laughs> um, okay, so what actually happened to the mice that got colonized with the poop from the babies who had been born to obese moms? Well, to sum it up, it was shitty. <laughs> uh, so first of all, their immune systems were about as functional as second semester seniors on spring break. <laughs> Uh, and then we fed the mice the fattiest, sugariest, cholesteroliest diet you can possibly think of. It's called a Western style diet. I, I'm, I'm not even joking. That is literally what the international scientific community calls it. So America, <laughs> something we can be very proud of. Um, so bottom line, don't eat that. It's bad for you. I don't care what kind of bacteria you got going on. Don't do it. Um, but the mice that got the stool from the babies who had been born to obese moms, well, they got even fatter on that diet. And so if we think about this all together, what does this really mean? Well, it means that you can blame your mom for everything. <laughs> so tell your therapist all that I'm sorry. I just put them out of business. I answered your question. It is your mom's fault. Uh, <laughs> okay, but I do want to end on a good note. So once we've identified the cause of a problem, we can start to fix it. 
So imagine it now. Poop, tra poop transplants just everywhere. Uh huh. <laughs> so while we do call it taking a number two, I do hope that now I've convinced all of you to agree with me that poop, it's number one. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Taylor Soderberg, yes, girl. Oh my God. Oi, oi, oi. Now, before we take a, a brief intermission, we've got one more, one more presenter for you. And uh, this, well, this, this gentleman, he's a, he's a systems administrator. Okay, he's a good friend of all of ours. And uh, tonight, well, Dan Wefflin is going to be talking about the pain machine, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Dan Wefflin. Huh? Hi. Uh, so a while ago, I got a job as a system administrator for a research group that studied pain. And they did all kinds of interesting studies. Like they found that if you're holding your romantic partner's hand while they induce pain, it reduces both your subjective rating of pain and the amount of activation in the pain processing parts of your brain, which I thought was pretty cute. <laughs> and then one of my coworkers thought, I wonder if this effect works in reverse. So they found people who had exes that they weren't over. <laughs> and, and what they do is that they put you in, in the scanner and then they get a picture of your ex and they show a picture of your show you a picture of your ex, right? And then they have a mean thing that they say your ex said about you. And I don't know what it is, but it's psychologists who study pain spending a week racking their brains to think of something really fucked up. <laughs> So they, they put you in the MRI, they show you a picture of your ex, they show you some text that's a mean thing they say your ex said about you, and then they turn on the pain machine. <laughs> and, and what they found is that people really hate that. We have a burning pain machine and a pinching pain machine. Other groups have other pain machines. <laughs> There's a, a group in uh, at the University of Nevada, Reno, and they, they have a balloon, and they, they, put, it, they put it in, in, in your butt, and they're like, shh, right? Like, shh, right? <laughs> We've all been to Reno. We, we know how it goes. Um, <laughs> and then they put you in the scanner, and they're like, on a scale of one to ten, how butthurt are you? <laughs> and then they send that data to me, where analyzing it is a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> There's a, another group with a balloon at, uh, at Stanford. They study uh, childbirth pain. And like women say they want someone who understands their pain, but they don't mean on an abstract mathematical level. <laughs> yes, I know it hurts. It hurts this much. The machines are all real expensive. They're, I think the burning pain machine is like $250,000. And they're expensive because they're extensively tested, right? They're very, very sure that they can cause you as much pain as they possibly can without hurting you even a little bit, right? <laughs> no permanent damage. Um, and I have to explain that, that no, they're expensive because there's no permanent damage and because they're extensively tested because then when they find out the pain machine is $250,000, they get real mad that we're wasting their tax money, right? They're like, I could burn you, pinch you, and shove a balloon up your ass for like 25 bucks and a trip to Party City. <laughs> but they're not gonna do the testing. They're not gonna think it's safe. <laughs> so believe it or not, it's actually, we have some trouble with people we have some trouble getting subjects, and then even once people sign up, 
because sometimes they sort of bail on us. Uh, and then that's when my coworkers are like, well, you know, it costs us $500 an hour to operate the MRI. I bet Dan will spend a day in the pain machine if we buy him a sandwich. <laughs> And I will. <laughs> uh, but y you know, it is important, you know, if you wanna, pain is really bad, as I'm sure you know. Uh, so if you're interested, you can come talk to me after I get off the stage. Uh, we are always looking for subjects and I would love to hurt you. <laughs> Okay, goodbye. Dan Wetland, ladies and gentlemen! Ah! Oh.